Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 134, Top 10 of 1000. An interesting take on favorite games from the top 1000 games on Board Game Geek. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. We record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, tonight I've got to thank Board Game Blitz, and other awesome board game podcast for inspiring our main topic tonight, which is going to be our top 10 games from the Board Game Geek Top 1000, but featuring a cool twist. Then I've got a pretty detailed review of the Adventuria adventure card game from Ulysses Spiel. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of the interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a couple of comments on our topic of dice towers and trays from last week. Jason Wallace writes, What about one dice tray for all, center of table, to roll in the open rules, no quick pickups, hide and lie? Well, that would work. Like, I, I get it, but... I, I find passing a table, a tray around, at least at my place is better. I have a big table, so it's a little easier to pass a, a tray around. But honestly, again, if it's cheating you're worried about, you're probably better off with a dice tower than a dice tray to make sure that it's fully randomized uh, for the reasons we mentioned on um, why you might want a dice tower during uh, that episode. Though I got to say again, uh, if cheating is the problem at your table, you've got bigger issues than needing some type of dice randomizer. Andrew Dacey, tabletop bellhop patron, mentioned our episode on the Misdirected Mark Slack channel. He said, I'm still going through the latest episode of Tabletop Bellhop, mm -hmm. but Mo's topic about dice trays and towers reminded me of a story. Back in the early 90s, when I was playing Warhammer 40k, we'd take the box lid from the big box and set that up as our craps table mm -hmm. next to the battle area. Later, when I was getting back into RPGs, I had a big tendency to send my dice rolling across and off the table because of that, and I had to work to break that habit. <laughs> now, I use an all-rolled-up dice tray, which I like because it folds flat and slips inside my all-rolled-up. Well, thanks for the comment and shout out, Andrew. Always good to see us get called out somewhere on a different show or on a, in some other Slack channels or whatever. I actually completely forgot uh, to be honest, that they existed. All rolled up was a thing. I remember them starting on G plus and kind of exploding everywhere. And everyone had them last time I went to origins. It was like everyone I hung out with had them. And I even more so forgot that came with the dice tray. And to be honest, I actually think when I first saw them, they didn't even have a dice tray. So that's probably a new feature. Now, this is something I think you should check out, Sean, since your main reason you bought a um, dice tray, a foldable one was for going to cons. Well, what all rolled up is, is basically made for cons and public play. It's a it's a like cloth thing you roll up that has a spot to put your dice, your pencils, your dry erase, your index cards, and includes a rolling area. I actually did take a look at those today. Uh, there, there's so many of them. Oh. <laughs> they they have uh, like fifteen for every different <laughs> set. You, I mean, every free league role playing game has like mm -hmm. eight different ones for it, and all the Pathfinder and it's and Numenera is another one that they've got a license yep. of. Uh, I got six pages in before they started getting into their out of stock uh, <laughs> wow. versions. It was. It's pretty intense, but it was interesting. They, Although I have to say, they didn't actually have any themes that really jumped out at me and made me right. want to buy. So something to keep an eye on, though. What's interesting is back when I heard about them and knew of them and were actually kind of thinking about buying one, it was like random fabric from Fabricland. <laughs> there weren't any licensed all rolled up. So it, it's good to see that the company is doing well enough that brands are working with them. So congratulations. Next, a comment on our Trap Words unboxing. Pitchwise pitch writes, Oh, Trap Words is brilliant. One of our favorite party games. I, I, I feel bad on this one. Like, the CGE sent us this, right? Full disclosure, they sent me a copy to review it. And unfortunately, it requires four players. 
And right now, that's just not a player count we can get to under the current stay-at-home orders here in Ontario. And despite being told it's only going to be 14 days, it's only going to be 28 days, it's only going to be the next six years, it just seems like we're never able to get together. And it's just not the kind of game that my youngest in particular is going to be able to play. So unfortunately, that one's going to sit at the pile of obligations, sitting on the top, ready to play. I've read the rules. It sounds cool. But I just haven't gotten the chance to play it because you need four players. It's a team game. And it's a team game where one player is going to read clues to another. Like, it's not like there can be a three-player variant. I guess we could play just to try the system, but, like, it removes the whole point of trap words. Like, like we could, no. I, we're going to wait till we can do it justice. I do apologize, CGE or anyone else waiting for our thoughts on this one. I will say it looks good. Like, like every indication that this one's going to be a really good game, but I haven't had a chance to try it. Right. Well, next, a comment from Courtney Jacks on our Open Learn Play Review Oh no, Jackson. Uh, nope, sorry, sorry uh, Courtney Jacks from Open Learn Play Review. Hello, I just heard my page mentioned on the Gamer Parents podcast episode. That was super cool. I just wanted to say thanks. I was mostly inspired by you guys. I've started with written reviews, just going through my collection, adding pictures and posting them on Facebook. I'm in the process of attempting to make videos for the Open Learn Play Review YouTube page. My intent is to have a four video file for every game I do wow. so everyone can see, learn, watch, and read everything they need to know about the games I do. Anyways, super cool hearing my page on such an amazing podcast. Thanks for all you folks do. Keep up the good work. Now, Court Courtney also left a comment on our rainy day AMA episode from a few weeks back to say, I got a good laugh when Sean described himself as Gloomhaven. That was great. <laughs> I believe that was this episode, right? Listen to three or four of them today. I believe I'm completely caught up, including the backlog. Well, that's impressive. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, thank you so much for the very positive comment, Courtney. Uh, happens to be in our chat room tonight as well. Uh, now you got to hear your name a few times, though I'm sorry about that. It was me typing. I put a space where I shouldn't have. <laughs> so we got it pronounced properly now. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I, I got to say, I'm impressed you went through our backlog. I, I'm still tempted to go out there and like delete the first 10 episodes or so, so that no one can actually hear what we sounded like at the beginning, but we haven't done that. I do hope episode zero is deleted. I think we did everything to purge that from the universe. So thankfully you didn't have to sit through that. Now I got to say, Courtney obviously has become a fan. Um, shortly after getting this comment, he went and reserved a seat through our Patreon, which is pretty awesome. So thank you very much for the support, Courtney. Yeah, thanks a lot, Courtney, and uh, I do apologize for those first 10 episodes or so. We were learning a lot about audio editing at that point. <laughs> now, finally, we've got a comment from friend of the show, Mark Spector, who commented on your first thoughts on the production copy of Garinto. He wrote, just listen to the, sh listen to the show and the Garinto comments. First, thank you. Second, Seasons of Change was a last-minute addition based on repeated feedback. Third, I'll look into the tile stripe in the future. If we reprint, I think we will. My French partner is already sold out and has. I'll create a tile upgrade if possible. Well, thanks for the comments, Mark, and for taking our suggestions to heart. Like, I, I love the fact that he actually listens to feedback. Like, hey, if I stack all the tiles up, it's hard to count. Mark has been fantastic for that all along. Like, I, I, I still remember we're sitting at a, at a, it's the Tulula Cafe here in Windsor. My daughter's at an art class down the street, and we're going to kill some time at the coffee shop. And I break out this prototype for Garinto, and I open it up, and I set it up, and I had a comment a question right away. I'm like, oh, man, I, I don't get this. And I I jumped on Facebook and I'm like, I texted Mark and within two minutes, he was back like, oh, that's this. And I literally was sitting there sending him screenshots as we were playing going, is this clear? Is this clear? Hey, you should change this. That was fantastic. I have never had a worked with a, a publisher so closely where it's so back and forth on our content. Now, as for getting reprintings, I'm pretty sure you're going to need to reprint sooner than later. After all, Corinto is the Azul killer. All right, well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Uh, one announcement for those of you here live. All right, our Ticket to Ride digital giveaway ends tonight at midnight Eastern. So you've got, I don't know, whatever that is from now because I don't feel like doing math. Take a moment right now. We'll wait. Head over to the blog. Make sure you enter. It shouldn't take you long. 
As a quick reminder, we're giving away a digital copy of Ticket to Ride from Asmodee Digital, and this contest is open worldwide. So less than three hours, I think, if my, my quick math is right. You have less than three hours to enter. So go do it right now. I, I think Tech hasn't entered yet. I haven't seen any tweets from him all week. Plus, uh, plus you know he's going to win anyway, right? So, all right, we're good. Everyone's entered. All right, let's move on to the rest of the show. Winner will be announced officially next week. Good luck. Thanks to everyone who stops in and catches us live in the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. I know we're always looking for people to take part and give us game suggestions or comments on our topics or tell us about the stuff we missed. But tonight, I want to invite all of you lobbyists to do something a bit more. I want each of you to open up Board Game Geek, go to browse and click on all board games, then navigate back to page 10. Or just click the link we're about to drop in the chat room. Now you can play along with us and let us know what's your favorite game on each page as we work backwards through the Board Game Geek Top 1000 games. We will be checking in at the end of the segment to see what kind of lists our lobbyists have come up with. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. All right, so Monday afternoon, while working, I was listening to podcasts. Yes, for those of you paying attention, I am still way behind. I'm currently working through shows from August 2020 with 600 and some still to go. And that's with purging a couple podcasts. But at the time, I happened to be listening to an episode of Board Game Blitz, where they did a really unique top 10 list that I thought would be fun to recreate here. So big props to Board Game Blitz for inspiring our topic tonight and for being an awesome show that promises to be much shorter than any episode we ever release. I strongly recommend checking out the show and hanging out with Crystal and Amby. So here's how this top 10 is going to work. We're going to go to Board Game Geek and take a look at the top 1,000 games. We're going to go and we're going to look at the games rated from 1,000 to 901 and pick our favorite game from that li- from that 100. Mm -hmm. Then move on to the games rated 801 to 900 and pick one game each (laughs) all the way until we get to the Board Game Geek Top 100. All right. So starting with number 10, which is a game on Board Game Geek that as of yesterday, because these do change, is ranked between 901 to 1000. So this sounded fun. And then I opened up Board Game Geek and looked and um, I was just in shock. Like we are looking at the, the best of the worst, right? We're, we're starting pretty low with thousands. Like when you talk 10, 10 lists, you don't tend to talk top 1000 lists, right? So I can't believe how many amazing games, like, like not just good game, amazing games fall as far back as 901 to 1000. Like stuff there like Mission Red Planet, Rise of Augustus, which I love to call uh, Roman Bingo, Strasbourg, one of my favorite games, Merlin, a Stefan Feld with lots of rondelles, Fleet, I, Fleet is still one of the tightest games I've ever played, Whistle Stop, Runebound Second Edition, and more. But out of all of those, I one name stood out right away. I picked it, then found all these others like, no, sorry, they don't compare. And that is Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. This game is amazing. This is the best kids game we've ever played and a game that as adults, we still enjoyed to play. And I finally got the Hidden Cellar expansion, which makes it even better. No, I did not put any expansions on this list. I'm just pointing out Graves Fighting Treasure wins with the expansion. It's even better. Now, I actually expected more games I've played to be way down at this section. I'm not exactly, you know, your hot new and your, uh, or even hot old game gamer. Yep. But there were actually only a couple. Still, though, it's really hard to go wrong with Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. Mm-hmm. I've enjoyed playing it with adults and kids, and it ended up on my list as well. So this was amusing. So one of the things I did with Sean is I had to write him because Sean has not, does not have the game experience I do. Hasn't played a ton of games. He's played, well, to be honest, compared to the average person, he's probably has played a ton of games. <laughs> but but in general, compared to most hobby board gamers, he hasn't tried a lot of the old classics and that. And I was a little concerned. I'm like, can you even find one per every thousand? He's like, I should be able to. And thankfully he was easily able to actually, like it, it wasn't as much of a problem as I thought it might be. Yeah, luckily your collection has uh, enabled quite a large uh, number of games to be played from this list. 
All right, moving on to number nine. This is ranked 801 to 900 on Board Game Geek and features a ton more great games. Personal favorites like Ice Cool, Letter Jam, Hey That's My Fish, Ticket to Ride New York, Istanbul the Dice Game, Battlecon War of Indides, a game that makes it feel like you're playing Street Fighter with board games, World's Fair 1893, recently reprinted to be more inclusive, Valley of the Kings, and well, Quirkle. And I got to say, I was really close to putting Quirkle on because Quirkle is such an amazing mass market game. It's the mass market game I like to show and shove in board gamers faces and say, look, you can buy good games at Walmart. But the one I am going to go with this time is actually Black Fleet, which I didn't realize at the time of picking it. It looks like is totally out of print. This is a pick up and deliver pirate game that I loved because it featured plastic little ships that actually hold cubes, which is something I hadn't seen before. Now, if you check our review from last week, there's an evolution of that mechanic, but I loved it. And you get to play both a merchant ship and a pirate at the same time. So you're trying to get your merchant ships through the channels while attacking other people with your pirates. And if the pirates sink a ship, they get to steal the treasure, but it's not worth points unless they bury it on an island. Comes with metal coins, which is something back then is just unheard of. I am a huge fan of Black Fleet. And for me, while there are a few fun games in this question, with Letter Jam being one I've recently played and we've reviewed on the channel, uh, and then there's games like Jaws, which while I enjoyed, I just didn't feel had the legs and and was never really going to play again. Uh, And unlike Mo, I'm not a huge lover of Dex games, so Ice Cool, while fun, wasn't my selection. Uh, And while I generally will always say I don't like Ticket to Ride, Mm. Ticket to Ride New York is just the right amount of Ticket to Ride. Mm-hmm. It's a quick, easy version that doesn't make me cringe the way someone suggesting I play <laughs> Ticket to Ride does. Now, is it a train game? Because there are no actual... <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Tune in to previous episodes for that discussion. All right, number eight. 701 to 800. Some of my favorites in this grouping, and I'm going to have to cut these down. I can't list all my favorites at this point already, (laughs) but Attica, Adrenaline, Wasteland Express Delivery Service, one of the best produced games I've ever seen with a full box insert. Like you want to see production quality? Wow. Pictomania, Thunder Alley, an actually good NASCAR game for someone who hates NASCAR, Uh, Gentist, Unfair, and more. Now, I am really tempted to go with Concept, which was on this list, because I still think it's one of the best party games of all time. But you know what? Uh, There is a style of game I love and Sean loves, and that is deck building. And my favorite deck builder still to this day is Core Worlds. I love how epic that game is and how much engine building there is, where you start off as these weak space barbarians, slowly building up your fleet and army as you move closer to the center of the universe and eventually conquer the Core Worlds. So this was a really tough grouping for me, as among other things, DC Deck Builder was included in it, which I do love, but I don't love all of it. Uh, we've mm. talked in the past how Teen Titans is, of course, the fav- my favorite version of it. But what is on that list is Can't Stop, which is one of those games that I just play all the time and mm. would happily sit with anyone and play any time, really. And I found as I was going through this list, those were the games that I drifted to it was that Mm. game while it may not be the best game ever and i may not be the cool hobby gamer for loving it it's that game that if someone puts it down in front of me yeah i'm gonna play i don't care who you are where i am that is a game i still i need to get a copy like a physical copy of can't stop at some point because like it is it's a great game what i was wondering is did you notice if teen titans was on the list is it further up i didn't see it i'm wondering if it's below yeah I didn't see it myself. All right, moving on to number seven, 601 to 700. Uh, Kind of out of place seeming are great games like 878 Vikings, which to me just should be ranked 878. Just, you know, if you're going to play with the board game geek ratings, there's one, there's a goal. Get get Vikings 878 rated 878. It's close enough at this point. Uh, Hyperborea, the the bag builder disguised as a thematic fantasy game. Red 7, which we talked about on the show many times. Lords of Zidit with its awesome program movement system. Blockus, Yido, XCOM, The Mind, Villainous, Among the Stars, Reef Ascension. There's so many. I actually found this one to be the hardest yet. This There were so many games here. And again, I almost went with Blockus for the same reason I almost went with Quirkle in its universal appeal. But, you know, I, at this point, I think enough people played it. I decided to go 
with one of the only games in my collection that I bought twice. The, the, it's a game that went out of print, got reprinted, and I actually bothered to go out and buy the new printing after trying it at the local game store, and that is St. Petersburg. This is an engine-building card game about building the city of Paint Petersburg, very much a card-driven Euro. Uh, it's one of the old Aaliyah classics that has come out. Uh, the new printing even added a new trade phase, which I think is an improvement on the game and just made it better. So my number seven is St. Petersburg. All right, well, another tough one, as I could have easily picked Ascension mm -hmm. uh, or even a game like Reef. But again, you know, I play Ascension digitally and I play Ascension mm -hmm. digitally for a reason. I actually can't imagine trying to manage all those cards in person it's mm -hmm. just become too big to be a reasonable physical board game anymore uh and what i did see is cribbage which i've been playing with my parents and my kids for decades and again it's one of those games that i'm just always gonna say yes to all right, I'm going to interrupt before I get to number six. So there's a little bit of confusion over exactly what we're pulling from here and where we're getting getting the game. So what we've done is we have taken the Board Game Geek Top 1000. And the way Board Game Geek is set up is it shows 100 items per page. So if you go to page 10 of the Board Game Geek collection, you get the games that are ranked 901 to 1000. So that's their, their overall rating on Board Game Geek. Well, we're looking at that page only. So only 901 to 1000 going out of those 100 games, what's our favorite? Right. And then we're going back a page and we're looking at 801 to 900 and going out of those 100 games, what's our favorite? So it's not our top 10 games overall out of all 1,000 together. We're grouping them by groups of 100, which is to me what made it interesting. Because I can easily, otherwise I just make a list of my top 10 games. Yeah, absolutely. And this doesn't necessarily, uh, it generally is for Mo because he owns everything, but it's <laughs> not necessarily games in your collection. No. Uh, again, you know, cribbage is, is one of those things where it's like, I, I you know, I, yeah, I think I do have a couple of cribbage boards around, but it's one of those things where it's your favorite game, not necessarily one you own in your collection. Yeah, it doesn't have to be in your collection. Everything I mentioned here is in my collection. Uh, spoilers, they're all behind me, actually. I went and <laughs> gathered each one of them. Uh, they are all behind me. Don't look if, if you're here live. All right, so moving on to number six. So again, this is games that are ranked from 500 to 1 to 600 on Board Game Geek. And which of the ones I, I think is best. And this is at the point, so I actually started 1,000 work forward when, when I created this list. And it is not getting any easier, is it? Like, like every list is just bigger and bigger. And I'm like, wow, this has some of my all-time favorite games. Um, Ashes, Rise of the Phoenix Born, Shipyard. Oh, I love Shipyard. I need to get that to the table more often. Rondells and Rondells and rondells the original space hulk like like the 1980s that's where these gene stealers come from space hulk uh tash kalar that is one i need to get sean we need to put that on the list because tash kalar reminds me of the duke it's an abstract arena game eminent domain probably my second favorite deck builder arc rate one of the best brain burners i've ever played Takedo, how many games of Takedo have the three of us played together? Wallenstein, like uh, the, the original German, Zhang Wo, a game about founding China, and Valeria Card Kingdoms, the game that's still better than Space Base and better than um, Machi Koro. But I have to go with our favorite two-player game of all time, the game I play the most with my wife, uh, a game I can't wait to play again over some pints at a brew pub, and that is The Duke. A chess-like abstract strategy game where the moves are on the pieces, but when you move, you flip them over to the other side and it may change what's there. So it was hard for me not to pick the Duke. And I think it's based on, on a lot of my other picks. I think most people would expect me to have picked the Duke. And while I do like it and I will play it all the time, mm -hmm. the game that I want to play all the time is Valeria Card Kingdoms because yeah. I really haven't had the chance to play that anywhere near as much as I would like to. Uh, another standout in this group that I really enjoyed was the networks. Mm -hmm. um, and and I mean, Eminent Domain, again, is, is another great one. Yeah, I, I oh, Valeria. Like my my first thought when I looked is I'm like Wallenstein. Oh, Valeria. Oh, Emin Domain. But Wallenstein. But Valeria. Valeria is so good. But I had to go with the Duke. Like, like if, if the Duke wasn't there, it would have been a much harder choice. Right. But seeing the Duke, and I'm like, no, sorry, it's got to be the Duke. Heck, even some people in the chat called that one before I said it. <laughs> All right, we're in the top five. We are halfway through. We're looking at games ranked 401 to 500. 
Interestingly, I found this one actually easier than the last few. Like there are some great games here, stuff I really dig, like Francis Drake, Alhambra, Chicago Express, Hammer of the Scots, a fantastic block war game from Columbia, uh, Star Wars X-Wing with the program movement, which actually like felt like an actual Star Wars space battle. Last Will, which is uh, B- Brewster's Millions, the board game. Ingenious, The Colonists, Thurns and Taxis, Fox in the Forest, Bean, Imhotep, Junkart, Stuff Fables. Oh, there's so many good ones. But I'm going to go with a game that I have said many times is by far the best out of print, the biggest hidden gem, the most difficult to find game that I love is Agizia. Except every other time I said that is now wrong because Stronghold Games now brought this one back through a successful Kickstarter under the name Agizia Shifting Sands, which includes the game I know and love on one side of the board and a new supposedly improved variant. I'll admit I'm still happy with the original. I didn't feel the need to pick this up because I love the version I have. But you know what? If anyone local has it, if once stores open up, I would love to try the new version of Agizia. And maybe it'll become like St. Petersburg with me and I'll buy another copy. Well, it was a tough call up against Sushi Go. But no, really, Imhotep is just a great mm-hmm. game and kind of won this uh, bracket pretty easily for me, be- despite a lack of competition, uh, or despite a lot of competition. Yeah. Uh, Imhotep is just so flexible. The number mm-hmm. of games you can play without repeating the oh. same game, like the, the variety in it, even yeah. before you add the expansion in, uh, was so great. It's just a fantastic game that's got that replayability that really helps drive a game to be that much better for Mm -hmm. me. What I love about that one too is it's a great gateway game because it's not complex, but it really shows off how different some hobby board games are. Absolutely. Like there is nothing like Monopoly, Sorry, Clue, or Trouble in Imhotep. It's completely different from all of those. And I love the look on people's faces who aren't really board gamers playing it and going, wow, board games can be so much more. Yep. Number four, 301 to 400. At this point, there's so many games on the list. Uh, like, it's even hard to find a small amount to highlight before getting to my final answer without just talking for half an hour about the great, great games. These are the best of the best of this for me. Medirio, Biblos, Battle Lore, my favorite Stefan Feld, Amerigo, Chinatown, the pure negotiation game, Glenmore, Macau, San Juan, Gizmos, Clash of Cultures, Blood Bowl Team Manager. In the Year of the Dragon, another Feld. Actually, there's a lot of Felds in this particular group. This is like the Feld section. Though my final answer isn't a Feld or even a Euro. Instead, it's the best dexterity game ever, Pitch Car. I have had more fun playing Pitch Car than most games I own. It's always a great time. I have everything published for it, except for the loop, which I had so planned on trying to get at Origins two years in a row now, but that didn't happen. I'm so close to having a complete collection. Well, this one, it turns out I need to play a lot more from this particular 100 games. Uh, I didn't have a lot to pick from, and as a result, despite not being one of my top games uh, of this particular series even, Mm. I went with Azul Stained Glass of Sintra, because I just don't love pitch cards as much as you, and really, any Azul is better than no Azul. There you go. Yeah, there's a lot of good games. We just copy what I put up there and throw that into play with Mo list, and then <laughs> we can get through. Them. All right, number three. We're in the top three. 201 to 300. Again, best games on the list, according to me. Pillars of the Earth. What a unique action selection system where you put all your meeple, well, that's the pawns, in a bag and draw them to figure out who gets to take actions first. Notre Dame, another fell. De Mocker, the recreation of German politics in board game form. You don't hear anyone talk about that game anymore. Survive, where you have a sinking island, a game that came out in the 70s is still popular. Hogwarts Battle, uh, the updated version of Mission Red Planet. Bruges, considered by many the best, Seffenfeld. Telestrations, one of the best party games ever made. Dungeon Lords, Hive, War Chest, Seasons. Oh, there's so many. Space Base, Isle of Sky. This, this was the hardest one yet. There are games here I love playing with my wife and games that I've laughed the most at while playing over any other game. Games that I made myself physically ill from laughing so much. I I came really close to picking Dungeon Lords for this because it is such a fascinating, deep Euro game with such a cool theme, but it's not that accessible. So I decided to go with the dice-based worker placement game, Alien Frontiers. 
This is an early Kickstarter success, uh, considered by many to be the first big board game Kickstarter that was successful. This game is extremely well balanced. It features dice-based worker placement, which was new at the time. It's a really cool theme. So much fun. The only problem with this one is this is one of the few games out there that I don't think was actually improved by the expansions. I personally don't recommend bloating it by adding the expansion. Just stick to the base box. Well, this one I actually felt was really easy, though there are many great games at this level. Pulsar 2849 took it with War Chest being a strong mm. runner up and Telestrations always a great group party yeah. game. Now, I do need to play Aeon's End at some point, though, as I suspect it could, uh, from what I understand about it, could really be a, uh, a strong one to take it uh, in the future when I do, if I ever do get it to play it. See, what I should probably do is right over here on my right is my copy of Aeon Zen in my two cell pile. <laughs> so I should probably take it out of there and just give it to Sean or at least play it with him once yeah, before yeah. then. My problem is Aeon Zen had a development curve that I, I found frustrating. So it was kickstarted by the original maker and it was put out with black and white art and it just kind of didn't look that great. And then they put out a new edition where they improved the art, but they put out about four different editions of this game in very short succession. Mm. And the version I own is one of the older ones and I just feel like i have an old obsolete game when there's better shiny versions out there and i took it as two choices i could upgrade my game and get the shiny new stuff or i could just never play it again which i realize is kind of silly but like they did make game improvements they did balance the game like it's not just they made it look prettier and i just feel like my copy is the inferior one and which has driven me not to want to play it now what i do want to try is aeons and legacy which is supposed to be amazing but yeah, Aeon's End, the deck building game where you never shuffle your deck. That alone is really neat. Plus, it's cooperative. So you throw those two things in there and you've got a very unique system. Right. Down to number two. 101 to 200. Now, the first thing I noticed here is how many games... I had rank rankings for it because um, you're looking on the page and it really sticks out if you've made a comment or you have rankings. And I'm like, wow, that's awfully full. So I went through and counted. I have played 60% of the games in this category. So... Favorites include Viticulture, Galaxy Trucker, Steam, Role Player, Tyrants of the Underdark, Ra, Village, Suburbia, Castles of Mad King, Ludwig, Chaos in the Old World, Vinhost Deluxe. Now, longtime fans of the show probably expected this game to be on the list at some point without even knowing where it was ranked on Board Game Geek, would be my guess. And my number two game uh, for the night is Shogun. I, I don't know what it is about this game, but like I see the name and I'm like, oh, I want to play Shogun. I had to go downstairs and I grabbed the box and I'm like, huh, I wonder if we can play Shogun online. I, I, there's something about that game that hooked me early. Uh, interestingly, playing the Wallenstein version first, but I prefer the theme of the Samurais. And I actually prefer the board, which is a little more Euro, a little less in your face, a little less uh, knife fight than than Shogun. So that's why Wallenstein didn't make them this. But Shogun, like if you ask me at the top of my head, what's my favorite game of all time? It's Shogun. So it had to be on here somewhere. Well, it ends up, I am Board Game Geek. It's in the top 200. So enough other people seem to agree with me. I say this, this was hands down the hardest of all of them. Hmm. Uh, and what I found was a lot of it depended on mood. Uh, there yeah. were games where depending on what mood I was in, this one, I could, I could see that this one would be my first choice, but you know, if I was feeling a little differently, I would probably go with that one as my first choice. Uh, great games like Jaipur, Azul Summer Pavilion, Suburbia, and Star Realms, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not to mention Magic the Gathering, which while I haven't kept up with is still yeah. a fantastic game. Yet I decided to go with Zaya Legends of a Drift system. It's Fair. just such a great game. And again, great replay, replayability, the variety of, of game you get with that game. Uh, again, even before you add, add in the expansions, but then even more so oh, yeah. with those expansions, it's just got so much longevity to it as a game. Yeah, Zaya is a fantastic game. Though I do say that the the Embers of a Forsaken Star really does help. Like I, I would never play it without the other expansions. Take them or leave them. But that is a great game. I, there were so many at this list. But oh, if you ask me, would you rather play Zaya or Shogun? I'm gonna go with Shogun. All right, here we go. Number one, 
what game out of the board game geek top 100 is our favorite now at this point i played 75 percent of the game on the list which doesn't surprise me at all there was a point in time where i made sure to get all 100 games on the list and play all 100 games and to be honest i got up to 95 because there were some out of print war games i was never able to try at that this was going back about 10 years at this point i'm at 75 percent. and to be honest the only reason for that is the new hotness because the way board game geek is used recently is some hot new game comes out it ends up in the top 100 and then just drops off as time goes on often there's a game that isn't even published yet in the top 100 because so many people back the kickstarter and i don't know if it's a feeling of well i spent my 500 it's going to be good so i'm going to rate it a 10 i don't know whatever it is so that's the only reason i think that i haven't played more of this list like this list not talking about the new hotness so there are some good games in here are are like trajan Code names, like, is there a better party game than code names? I used to think not. I know I still prefer, to be honest, I still prefer concept and um, illustrations. But overall appeal, Russian Railroads, my favorite engine builder, Patchwork, the game we play almost as much as the duel together, Battlestar Galactica, the exception to the rule, the one hidden trader game I love because it's a team-based game, not a one versus many. Um Eclipse, Twilight Imperium, El Grande, Kalis, Keyflower, Dominant Species, Race for the Galaxy, the game I have now played more than 150 times, Through the Ages, Clans of Caldonia, Anar- or Anachrony, I almost said Anarchy, Power Grid, Caverna, oh, it's this whole list is amazing. I don't think that there's a game I hate on this top list. Now, I admit, I almost went with Dominant Species. That's another one for the Sean should play it at some point list. Like, that is one of the best best heavy games I've ever played, one of the best epic games, but the time it takes to play, like you're looking six to eight hours, and the learning curve, like this is a worker placement game based on some scientific stuff about evolution and climate change, and like there's just, it just doesn't get played enough for me to put it as number one. Then I was really close to putting down Orléans, because to me, you know what, I, I, I think Orléans is actually better than Shogun. But for some reason, I hear Shogun and I get excited more than I get excited when I hear Orléans. When I hear Orléans, I'm like, yeah, yeah, Orléans is great. I know that one. But when I hear Shogun, I'm like, ooh, I want to play Shogun. Let's play it. So Orléans was really close. But you know what? I think I had to take a page from Sean's earlier book and go with the game that gets played the most often. And that here, uh, since I got it, has been Terraforming Mars. Like right now, we're, 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 we call it the bellhop's law, right? The best games in your collections are the ones that actually hit the table. And my copy of Terraforming Mars is the game in my collection that gets played the most often. From me, other players at local events. I can't remember the last time I brought that out to a local game store and I didn't teach someone to play or someone didn't grab my copy to go play it. So my number one game out of the board game heap, top 100 is Terraforming Mars. Yeah. So many great games, and I have to say, and honestly, this is all thanks to Mo and his collection, <laughs> I've played a lot more of them than I had expected when I first got this assignment. Again, we talked about how we were concerned that, you know, was I actually going to have uh, a game in every one of these hundred mm-hmm. lists? Um, and, you know, with Terraforming Mars, uh, Terra Mystica, Clans of Caldonia, yeah. all in this top 50, how can you go wrong? And I have to say, Orléans was even on my almost there for me. I've only yep. played it a few times, and I'm not normally that Euro heavy mm. gamer type, but it was really fun. Like yeah. that was the game where I'm like, okay, maybe I could be a Euro player because I really dug that game. Um, I wish it was available on BGA because oh, we yeah. would probably have a game of that going all the time, but. I felt, I don't know, maybe guilty that I I wasn't deck building enough. Uh, I have to say the game that my kids are more interested in playing right now over Hogwarts Battle, thank you, Monster Box and Monsters, is Uh. Clank, the deck building game. And so that's what came in as number one on my list. I mean, I am a big fan of Clank, though a bunch of these other games for me are above it, but it's definitely up there. Yep. It deserves anything in the top 100. And I got to say, I, Board Game Geek Reigns, take them or leave them. You know what? This was fun. I actually had a lot of fun going through this list, more than I expected. It was one of those, I kind of mentioned it to Sean, and then Sean started putting stuff in chat. And I'm like, oh, he's actually doing it right now. Because <laughs> I just asked him if he could find one. And instead of just like, yeah, yeah, I can find one on every list. So then I started doing it. And then we ended up with the, the earliest completed 
show notes for our show, I think, ever because of that. Yep. So that that was it. We we went through the it was fun. Like, like if you didn't do this while playing along while we were doing it, take the time. Go on board game geek, grab the top thousand, go through it and pick one game from every hundred that you think is the best on the list. No judgment on anyone else's list. No, no say, ah, oh, that's rated wrong. Don't go in and start giving things ones that are too high and tens that are too low. Just compare what's there to your personal preference. Pick out the game of your choice. And you may discover uh, some interesting things going through and, and you get to those hard to do, right? Like, how do I compare telestrations? I can't, I forget what's in the same group and I don't feel like scrolling up, but how do I compare telestrations to uh, clans of Catalonia? Like, like they're so different. And I'm like, well, if it's three in the morning at extra life, I want to play telestrations. Yep. If it's, you know, I just cracked a coffee and we're about to start a 10 hour gaming marathon. I played a warm up game. Now I'm ready to go. Then it's going to be Orleans or yep. Catalans of Catalonia or whatever. Well, I mean, and yeah, then, you know, telestrations was up against War Chest yeah. and Pulsar 2849. Yeah, and then, yeah, the, wow. there's your range of games <laughs> yeah you know you've got you've got that quick quick fun party game versus the i'm gonna spend three or four hours playing a yep. deep game it's and uh, then in, in the middle of the abstract two-player thinky brainy yeah. strategy game too which is again another quick one but heavy thought you know yes yes all right well that's it for our walkthrough of the top 1,000 games on BGG. Picking one game out of each 100 that are our favorites. Now let's head over to the lobby and see what they thought of our list and see what some of their favorite games are from the Board Game Geek Top 1,000. All right, lobbyists, were you playing along? Let's see some of your top 10 lists. So I've got a few that post uh, from folks who posted earlier in the Discord. Uh, I'm going to go through these a little quickly because there's a lot of people here and everyone's got an opinion. That's awesome. So I, I love this, but we don't want to take all night. Uh, if we go with uh, Courtney, we've got uh, Raccoon Tycoon coming in at number 10. I have heard good things about that. Call to Adventure, Wasteland Express Delivery Service, Century and New World, Valeria Card Kingdoms, Venus. Ding, ding, ding. I need the bell. Newton, which uh, I guess they, they, I saw mentioning in the chat room, is a real sort of under, unknown uh, sort of uh, standout. Tapestry, Hansa Teutonica, and Scythe. Ooh. Hansa Teutonica is so good. So good. There's some great games on that list. I know you weren't a fan of Wasteland. Wasteland's one I really liked, but, I, but you know what? You were so new to the hobby gaming then, and we were playing with a player who checked out right at the beginning i i i should get i i and i think i've even said i need to give that another chance yeah. um I, I really didn't enjoy it it was a yeah. really bad experience and i it's one of those things where it's not a bad game it, it's a bad experience yeah it could be a good game and and maybe i don't like it but yeah that was a really bad experience of the game no totally fair all right who's next next up we have brian kurtz uh, coming in at number 10, Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunter. Hell yeah. There we go. Which he learned about from the Bellhop. Uh, Quirkle, Pictomania, yep. Blockus, oh, that's a good one. Dixit Journey, Catan, Mice and Mix Sticks, Mysterium, Ticket to Ride, and Patchwork. Nice. That is a good series of games. Absolutely. There. Very Definitely. solid. Definitely. And you know what? I, to be f fair, I think a lot of people probably have Catan coming in at that number five spot. <laughs> I was surprised. Well, Deanna noted the same thing. She was surprised how low Catan is nowadays. But I know there's yeah. a lot of people that hate on it lately. So yeah, no, absolutely. And again, it's it's uh, yeah, and even stuff like like Blockus being down at the six hundred to seven hundred seems a little low. But again, I, again, I wonder if it's it's the gatekeeping, right? Yeah. It's the the. The players who are like, oh, that's a mass market game. I'm going to rate that a one. And I, at some point also, there's just too many games. You know, if there Boy, are yeah. a thousand great games, you can't fit them all into the top 100. <laughs> all right. I'm going to go through Deanna's list here. So Angie Games, our moderator, my wife, in the 10th spot, she's got 1812, The Invasion of Canada. Oh, you've got them broken up. Okay. Oh, she did everybody's. She did everyone's together. Oh, there's a different oh, wow. way we can present it. Do we want to start over? Uh, I, I don't even, I can't, uh, that one, that's actually kind of hard for me to read. Um, the way it's all piled in there together. Um, 
All right, so she is going to break it up. Sorry about that interruption. Sarah, so here's the NS. So 1812, the invasion of Canada. Fantastic block war game. Quirkle, but I almost had it on my own list. Core Worlds, there we go. We agreed on that one, though I know she was close to picking Attica. <laughs> uh, Reef, next. Valeria Card Kingdoms, lots of Valeria love here tonight. Imhotep, she agrees with you on that one. Uh, St. Petersburg, though she went with the first edition, which is actually ranked higher than the reprinting, which I don't know if that's just... A, I, I think that's more of a, at the time it came out, it was really good. So it got a lot of tens, whereas the new edition's better, but no one wants this crusty old game. I think he got some of that going on there. Um, she agreed with me on Alien Frontiers. I wasn't expecting that one. We've got Castles of Mad King Ludwig, one that I felt should have been on my list somewhere, but there was something else that beat it out. Oh, Shogun. That's right. It was compared to Shogun. Sorry, Castles. Right. And while she agreed with me on Terraforming Mars. Nice. Right. And uh, we've also got uh, Major Kayla, Danielle, in, has another one in our uh, Discord. Yep. She has uh, Suro, almost matchy Koro, hard call, uh, mm. Rivals for Catan, but very, few two she'd actually, but very few she'd actually liked in that 800 to 900 round. Fair. Uh, Thunderstone, Thunderstone, nice. and almost got, builder. she almost got Can't Stop in there as well, <laughs> uh, Ex Libris. Uh, for the six that is, I, I have a copy of that downstairs in the in the pile of maybe maybe shame maybe put an extra life. <laughs> oh, and she's got adore this game in all caps on that one. Uh, nice. Betrayal at House on the Hill, not a big surprise yeah. there. From there, Potion Explosion, Dice Forge. Oh, Taka. Dice Forge! I've only played on BGA and it's so good. Takanoko. Yep. Uh, that Panda game. Sagrada, and yeah, good. Uh, and Power Grid. Uh, would would love Seventh Continent, but haven't gotten it to the table. <laughs> yeah. So I know Ryan's got us a list. Can we scroll back and find out when it started? Uh, yeah, let me just see. Because Ryan, uh, Ryan did what we asked people. See, people cheated because uh, <laughs> most of the people who gave us lists ahead of time are part of our Discord, and we kind of gave them a heads up of what we were doing tonight. So it's awesome they took part. But Ryan actually did it as we were going. Uh, I'm just sort of dropping down here to try and find out where he started. So, um, first page dream home or Kingsburg Kingsburg. There's a game. No one talks about anymore. That was one of the first dice placement games. We roll a handful of dice. You put them on spots and get stuff. Right. Uh, alien frontiers. Yes. Alien frontiers. That was on my list. Good one. Uh, where are we at? Sorry. Just, uh, trying to figure out where uh alien frontiers uh eight minute empire legends I've not uh, tried that one zuloretto that was one of the first hobby games i taught sean after we reconnected after many years solid uh, game among the stars oh, i was so close one of the best drafting games i'll take that over seven wonders any day jamaica nice uh and uh port royal you know what i've never tried port royal I've, I've heard of it, but I have not tried it. Is that uh, all the list we so have from the chat? We've caught up. We've caught up with Ryan. So uh, <laughs> uh, Clash, Clash of Cultures. Culture. There we go. Fantastic empire building game. Rivals uh, through the ages. Feels more like Civ because you actually have a map and you actually build out and build little buildings on it. It has that more of the feel of the actual Sid Meier civilization. Right. It actually at the time was my favorite, but I need to play it again. It's been too long. Yeah, it's you know what? It's really tough. Oh, and I, I did check uh, Teen Titans. So you have text list. Text list should be on the Discord. Uh, is it? Uh, I, oh, no, he posted it here. In the, oh, he posted it here. Uh, let me I got see. it. Oh. Found it. All right, so we got in the top or the last spot, Raccoon Tycoon. Keep hearing good things. Need to try it. Grim Forest. Fantastic looking miniatures. Never tried the game. Lanterns, the Harvest Festival. I, that was definitely a short list for me. Reef, of course. Trail of House on the Hill. Everyone loves it. Just not me. Don't listen to me on that one. Camel Up. I, the, or Camel Cup, however you want to word it. Camel Up. That is a fun race game. Point Salad. There, That's a need to try. So, Kevin, uh, when we can hook up again. That's one I definitely have to try. I'm impressed to see Space Base there already because I know he just got it around the same time I did. Seems like he's loving it as much as me. Santorini, which is, of course, a great abstract strategy game with dice. And Crokinole. And I'm actually kind of surprised we don't have more Crokinole on the list, to be honest. Uh, Crokinole was a game that when I was a kid, everyone had. I think Sean had 
a croconole table. I had a croconole table, but it was one of those you flipped it over and it was also a, a chess table and a checkers table. And I they had the little plastic thing. I never played it. I, I never knew what to do with it. I remember playing around with it and then like didn't hear about croconole for years. And then all of a sudden now everyone's playing it. Uh, and actually, uh, Bike Guy Dave, formerly known as Math Guy Dave, did have his list in there, but he didn't break it out diff- uh, the same way as everyone else. So I, I skipped over it because he, he posted it all on one line. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he's got Warhammer Quest, Call to Adventure, nice. Dungeons and Dragons Castle Ravenloft. A lot of dungeon crawl adventure games there. Among the Stars, oh, Valeria Card Kingdoms. There we go. Queen Domino, Mystic Vale. Above and below, and he notes nice. these are getting hard, Carcassonne <laughs> and Jaws of the Lion with a question mark there to uh, wrap it up. Jaws of the Lion's a good one. It I, is. I, I, you know what? Hey, Gloomhaven, it's too much compi- commitment. So what Deanna's is doing is she's throwing in the chats everyone's answers together, which is really cool. Yep. What, what's interesting to see how many, like we have three people picked Reef. So I'm going to go back to Deanna's original list, see how many overlaps we have here. <laughs> uh, do we have, no, nope, that's D's only, here we go. So going back to 901, I'm looking for duplicates. So we have three votes for uh, Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. So our number 10 for overall, all bellhop fans, the lobbyists all put together, assuming D got everyone here, she may not have, <laughs> is Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. Second would be Raccoon Tycoon with two votes. Then everything else was single people. Yep. So, so Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters wins that one. Then that's Deanna's list. I am scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. 800 to 900. Um, Call to Adventure has two. So it looks like Call to Adventure is the one duplicate we have in that. Which that's another one. Um, we had a local gamer was bringing it out to game nights all the time and I didn't get to do it. Uh, two for Quirkle as well. So Quirkle had two as well. So tie between Called for Adventure and Quirkle. Uh, I thought we had two can't stops. When we uh, were going no, through. there was a, I, I picked can't stop and someone else had it as a second. Okay. So in the, the 800 to 700, we didn't have any duplicates at all. So <laughs> I thought we had two core worlds. Someone much mentioned it. No repeat. I'm, I'm awesome to see Pictomania on there. That is, that is the gamer's version of win, lose or draw. It's so good. Core world is one of those games that I need to play more with you to get. I've, I've played it, but it was kind of, we, we played it it's, and we rushed, we rushed it a little bit and, yeah. and I need to the problem, get a it, feel for it. The problem with the learning curve on that one is it's long. It's like a three, four hour game. Yeah. So you don't get that play it multiple times. Yeah. Uh, six to 700. Again, no duplicates. I don't see any duplicates in there. Oh, X Libra. No. No, no, Sorry. Reef is the six to seven in the six to seven hundred. Reef, reef is, is in the six to seven hundred. Why am I blind? Three reefs. Yes, yes, there <laughs> we go. Three reefs. Wow, my eyes. Three reefs. There you go. Reef definitely wins the six to seven hundred. Valeria five. Card Kingdoms hands down destroys oh, the yes. five hundred to six hundred. Yeah, yes. But we have five <laughs> people or so doing Valeria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one's done. Um I see two Imhotep. So Imhotep is the winner for four hundred to five hundred. Mm. Three to four hundred. Uh, Looks like it's all across the board. That is all over the place. Yeah, no. That is all over the there. place. Everyone's got a different game for that one. Uh, two to three, same thing, all across the board. Which is weird because that's where you figure that we you'd all pick the same ones. No, two to three. Oh, two I for, also. Oh wait, two, two for two Alien, for Alien Frontiers. Frontiers. There yep. it is. Yep. There, the, we take it with that one. And then, and then one to two hundred. Is that what I just did? The no, chat scrolling, which is making it hard. <laughs> uh, I don't I, see any duplicates. No, no duplicates. All right. In the top 100, we have we, two terraforming Marses. Uh, yeah, just two terraforming Marses. Yeah, so, Ryan had a different set of lists. Brian also had a, had a lot of party games, which was interesting. And then uh, Tech did qualify that it's games that his kids want to play. Absolutely. There's, there's which a is lot fair. Of different ways to pick games on this list and again there were a couple a couple of those groupings where it's like if i'd been sort of feeling different moods Mm -hmm. and and picking on different moods i would have gone the different way uh zaya wouldn't have been picked uh you know necessarily yeah so there's a lot a lot no definitely this is why every anytime this is why one reason we don't always do top 10 lists in general but like when i did my top games of all time i'm like it's not my top games of all this my top games are right now 
Yeah. Because that's what I feel like. And that's why how I did it was if you ask me to play and what I did is I use this piece of software that compares two games. And I said, if you went to me right now and said, can you play this or this? What do you want to play? I picked the one I wanted to play. And I, the, the list ended up being very interesting to the fact Shogun wasn't even on the top. <laughs> it was like number 18 or something like that, because right. there was other stuff that at the time I was just like, oh, no, that sounds fun. Let's do that. Right. So, yeah, Deanna went with games she wants to play the most. Right. Like, ooh, nostalgia. When's the last time we played that was a big factor for her. Right. Wow, Ryan's played less than 10% of the top 1,000, which is fair. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I was shocked by how many I did play. Yeah, Brian Kurtz with, with the Marie Kondo, the, the What Spark Joy. I, I was tempted to just go with the, the most played. Like the, the, but then you, you would have had Blockus. You would have had um, Ingenious would have been on the list because we used to play it with the kids all the time. It's a brilliant yeah. Nizia abstract game. Um, Quirkle would have been on the list. Like it would have been a very different one. All right. The yeah. Sea Otter stream. <laughs> oh, wait, someone, no, someone, this someone's is... checking out behind me, I guess. I don't know. Oh, I've, got, okay. I've, got my, I've got my otters behind me. Oh, that's that's what's going I've got, on. I've got All a right. stuffed. I've got I've got the otter sign. I've got the stuffed otter back here. No, no, fair. All yes, right. Sean. Sean collects otters. If you're ever <laughs> looking for a gift for Sean, send something otterific. Uh, All right, I think we're good. Uh, first day, this was awesome. Thank you, everyone who took part. That was a lot of fun. Like just doing it ourselves was fun. I thought it was really cool. How many of you took part? I definitely appreciate that. And keep them coming, right? Like this is going to go live on Tuesday. We'll have um, a version of this particular segment up on Sunday, on Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, Saturday, Saturday on YouTube. So if you're listening to it there, if you listen to the auto podcast or you see a post on Twitter with this reply with your top 10, I would love to see them. Maybe we'll read them off next week. I'm not going to promise anything. We'll see. It depends how many we get and how good those lists are. No, every game pick tonight was valid in great games. Thank you for taking part. You got anything before I close this out? No, I think that was a fantastic uh, experiment and experience with yes. all of our lobbyists. All right. Remember, if you got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on ask the bellhop. Welcome to a review of the Adventuria adventure card game big thanks to ulysses spiel for sending us a pile of adventuria content to check out so the adventuria adventure card game was designed by michael palm and lucas zach this particular core set features artwork from nadine sackel this is the core box for adventuria this is the first thing you'll need to pick up, the one box you need to use all of the adventures, expansions, and other Adventuria content out there. So this is the, the start of the your introduction to Adventuria. Now, Adventuria overall is a non-collectible card game set in the world of the Dark Eye, or Dashwar's Og, Germany's most popular role-playing game rule set and setting. Now, the core set, this particular box includes four characters, which you can use to play the game in one of two modes, either dual mode or adventure mode. In dual mode, each player picks a character and then battles against the other characters with the goal being to reduce their life points to zero. Now in adventure mode, the players work together to play through a cooperative fantasy adventure. Now, this box includes a full advancement system allowing players to improve their characters over time. And there's also a system for deck building and customizing the included character decks. Now, duels can be played with two to four players, single duel taking 15 minutes per player, roughly. That's kind of an estimate, depending on how long you take the thinking. Now, adventures can be played actually solo or up to four players. Now, uh, these tend to take about 45 minutes per act to an hour per act. Now, note, there's a three-part adventure in this box set. You can technically play that with six players. It gives you all the cards you need to play with six players, but you're going to need some additional heroes because the box only comes with four. Now, this box set has a manufactured suggested retail price of $34.49 US dollars. Now, to see exactly what you get in this card game starter set, check out our Aventuria Adventure Card Game unboxing on YouTube. 
Now, I would say I was pretty happy with most of what you get in this box. Uh, rules are split into two books, clear directions on where to start. I dig the dice. You get four D20s and four D6, and each of these features a, the dark eye symbol, the symbol for Dashwazog, on the result you want the most, which is the one on the D20s and the sixes on the D6s. Card quality is excellent, but I will note the cards do feature black borders, and years of playing Magic the Gathering has taught me that can rub off over time. So this is a game that you're, you're going to be shuffling quite a lot and handling your cards a lot, and you may want to sleeve those cards. Now, what I was most disappointed with with this box is that there is no actual way to store, sort, or protect the cards or any other counters or anything else that comes in this box. It just has that traditional trough-style cardboard insert where you've got, you know, the trench in the middle of your box. I think anyone picking up this game is going to try to need to find some form of card storage solution. Now, along with this, I will also note there is a ton of air in this box. Well, I understand that game box sizes are based on things like shelf presence and sticking out and being able to feature artwork. Just this box is way bigger than it needed to be. Yeah, unfortunately, from what we've I've been able to, to determine, they do sell and work with a lot of third parties on storage systems and therefore don't actually make their own yeah. storage system with that you can you can buy as as one of their expansions or kits. Yeah, I couldn't find any good way to store this. And it's not like just buy a bunch of magic card boxes because there are other components. It's not just cards. So right now, what I have personally done is I have some stuff from Quiver Time. Uh, previous sponsor of the show great stuff that i've at least sorted some of the cards into now it's not in my quiver but it's just in the, some deck boxes that i have of those which works but I, you know as soon as i open the first expansion i'm gonna have to find something else i can do all right well so there's two modes of play included how about we start with how to fight a duel in aventuria all right, so start, pick a character. There are four characters. You're going to grab all that stuff for that character. Uh, you're going to grab a hero card, a skill card, health tracking cards, th a deck of 30 action cards. There are, again, four different decks, a uh, hero token, a D20, and I would recommend grabbing 2D6, though the game only comes with four. So if you're playing with more than two people, you take one die and you can re-roll or pass them around. You're going to put your hero card on your table in front of you. Uh, the skill card, you can do what you want with. You don't actually use it in duels. I usually leave it face up on the table, but you don't need it. You're going to draw that action card deck, shuffle it, and draw five cards. There is an option to take a mulligan, letting you draw five more cards. You then randomly select a starting player by taking those hero tokens, mixing them up, and drawing one. That player then gets the starting player token, and everyone else gets a fate token. So really, it's not all of that dissimilar to most fantasy dueling card games we might name in setup. The big difference being that character card, uh, which is, is different than what you might get in a magic uh, yeah. game. Which I, I don't play enough magic anymore, but I think it might be similar to having like commander or whatever. Or you have a planeswalker in play that gives you abilities. So there are several phases to each round of an Aventuria duel, but none of them are really overly complicated. Uh, the first few phases you can actually do simultaneously, which is a nice touch. Everyone's going to draw two cards and then select up to two cards from their hand, which is now larger, to turn into Endurance. These cards are placed face down on the table. Now, in general, these cards are effectively unavailable for the rest of the game. And I say in general because this is a card bias game, and of course there are exceptions. So choose wisely when you're deciding what to turn into endurance. Next, you're going to ready any uh, exhausted cards or untapped your tapped cards. Sorry, Woods of the Coast. And they can protect that term all they want, and we can't publish a game with that word in it, but they can't stop everyone who talks about turning their cards when who uses their magical word. Yes, we have exhaust and ready here in this one. Uh, my favorite still is actually crank. No other games seem to use crank, but it's just what you physically do with the cards. I always like that one. But I'm probably going to use tap for the rest of this just because it's what I'm most used for. Next, starting with the first player, person's got that token. Take any number of actions done in any order until you've got none left you want to do. Now, the actions include playing an action card, so something is in your hand. You're going to have to pay the endurance cost on it by tapping your endurance. Action cards include all kinds of things like weapons, armor, skills, talents, etc. Now, most of these are permanents. They stay in play and then can be used every round. There are also a number of one-shot cards and free actions that are played then discarded. Now, free actions can actually even be played on your opponent's turn. Now, most of the action cards are going to have new actions on them. 
These usually have an endurance cost and are exhausted after use, so you can only use them once per round. These are going to let you do things in the game, like draw more cards, heal yourself, or attack. So is there a timing sequence with cards and actions? Yeah, like, so if, if, uh, if in a duel, uh, if I have an mm -hmm. instant and you have an instant, how do we know which happens first? Is there a... There are no specific timing rules on your turn. You can play your actions in any order. All of the free actions are based, the reactions based on something. So timing is obvious. Like, like you wouldn't be able to play the card unless there was a reaction. And I didn't see any cards that like a counter spells that would counter a counter spell. Maybe that's later in the game, but there were no detailed rules in the book for that. It basically stated that the one shot cards will tell you when you can use them. And yeah. in all games I played thus far, it was obvious. It was after taking damage, play this card to prevent or after doing this, play this or after that roll, re-roll that. Right. Now, one special type of action, of course, is the attack. Every character starts with a basic attack. That's on that hero card that's always going to be available because that card starts in play. Now, several action cards like weapons and spells will also include attacks. Now, there are three types of attacks at Adventuria, melee, ranged, and magic. And in each round, you can only do one of each. Even if you have multiple weapons of a type up, you only get to pick one to attack with. Now, making an attack means rolling a d20 and trying to get under your skill rank for the type of attack. And every hero has different ranks for all three types of attacks. If you succeed... On the check, by rolling your number or lower, you roll damage. Your opponent then gets a chance to dodge. Every character has a dodge roll. They try to roll under the dodge. If they'd make it, they reduce the damage by half. Finally, if the targets manage to get any armor cards into play, they can further reduce the damage by the card's PRO or protection rating. That does exhaust that piece of armor, though. So if you're getting hit multiple times, you're going to need multiple pieces of armor. And of course, there are limitations. You only have one helmet, one chest, and all that type of stuff in play. Any damage left is removed from your health, which starts at 40, and is tracked using these health tracker cards in a way anyone who's played Euchre will be familiar with. So with 40 health, I would have expected the games to run a little longer than your average magic games, though, as we experience today, what I notice is there's this ramping factor. Mm -hmm. So things kind of speed up as you accelerate. So it's the timing wise, I think it actually runs out pretty similar to a 20 point game of magic uh, because of, of how you, you start with no armor or anything. Uh, yeah. and, 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 you know, if one person doesn't get armor out and you get your weapons out, they're going to start dropping pretty fast. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there is definitely, that is something that will come up multiple times in this review is that basically it's an engine building game. There is a feeling of escalation in this and, and urgency that grows as you play. Now, once a player has completed all their actions, the player to their left takes their actions. At, keep going around the table till everyone's gone. Once you've gone, you do some little end of round cleanup. Starting player passes the start player token to the left and a new round begins. Once there's one player left standing, they win the duel. Well, easy enough. So now along with this basic flow are some interesting special rules that are definitely going to set this apart from other dueling card games. For one, this is based on a fantasy role-playing game and there is a critical hit system or a crit system. I shouldn't say hit system because it's on both. If you roll a one on the D20, again, low rolls are good. You get to draw a card from your deck. If you roll a 20 on the D20, that means you have to discard a random card from your hand thing you do not want to happen the other thing is there is a fate point system at the start of the game you're going to put a number of fate tokens in play equal to the number of players times two whenever you miss an attack roll you get to collect one of these from the center of the table or if there aren't any from the center of the table you can steal one from an opponent at any time you can spend one of these to do a few things first re-roll a die second give you an additional endurance for that round which goes away at the end of the round or draw one card from your deck yeah, this is unconventional for a card game, but certainly very familiar to any role players out there. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's really interesting because one thing I found is because you're not playing your whole hand every time and you're holding on to those cards, mm -hmm. but only five, you're generally going to ha only have a couple of cards in your hands, especially in those earlier rounds. And so if you have to discard, you are guaranteed to mm -hmm. discard something you have plans for. Yes, yes, that is definitely an aspect. Uh, note you can re-roll using a fate point if you do critical fail, and that is often a very valid use for one of those fate tokens. Now, while Adventuria Adventure Card Game does come with four preset hero decks, there is a system for building custom decks. So every character's skill card 
uh, which is the card that you don't generally need while you're dueling. But if you try to build your deck ahead of time, has a list of card types they're allowed to have in their deck with uh, like uh, three different ratings of weapons, three different types of armor, items, talent, skills, and so on. In addition, a number of the cards can only be used by certain characters. So they're cards specific to that character. You obviously can take those if you're that character, but you can't take them if you're another. Now, working within those two limitations, you're free to build your deck with any of the cards that come in the game. Now, the deck must contain exactly 30 cards, and at most, you're allowed two copies of each card. Now, one issue with this character building system is there aren't really any spare cards here. You get four 30-card decks, 120 cards. To modify one hero's deck, you're going to have to cannibalize another. Now, the Arsenal of Heroes expansion is specifically made for players who don't want to do this. It contains copies of all of the non-unique hero cards from the core game, two of each, as well as some that were originally con promos. So as long as you're buying your own box, uh, core box, or only playing with, say, two players, you can do some deck building. But mm -hmm. with a group of four or even really three, you're pretty much stuck with those base stock yeah. decks. All right. Well, we know how to duel now. How about you lead us on an adventure next? All right, playing a cooperative adventure in Adventuria uses a lot of the same rules as fighting a competitive duel, with the main difference being a lot more story elements, the use of hero skills, and, well, the fact you're working with the other players instead of attacking them. You start by picking an adventure. Now, this box has two short adventures and one long three-act adventure. And that three-act adventure can actually be played as three separate standalone adventures if you wish. To do this, you're going to pick an adventure. You're going to open the book to the right page. You're going to grab all the adventure cards for that adventure and have them ready. Players are then going to pick which character they want to play and gather all the stuff for the character, as well as doing any deck building before you get going. Now, as part of that deck building, your first adventure, you won't be able to do this, but you will be able to select three previously won reward cards to put into your deck. Now, you've mentioned that these are 30 card decks. Yeah. Do you have to take something out to add any of those three cards in? Yes, you do. So you are always limited to the 30 cards as well as fulfilling those card limits on the back of your skill card. So if you happen to get free weapons as um, rewards and your deck can only hold two weapons, you're only going to be able to use two of those cards and you're probably going to have to pull out some weapons that were already in there, as an example. Now, I will note, having played through all these adventures, none of the decks were full at any of their things. So like my deck said I could have five items. Well, I only had four. So your first of each reward type looks like you could probably toss it in pretty easily and remove any card from your deck. But once you get up to your second and third, you're probably going to have to remove cards of that type. Now, each adventure starts off with a narrative phase, and this is played by having a player read the story to everyone else. Eventually in the story, you'll get to a point where you're called to make a check. These come in all kinds of reasons, story-based reasons, like spotting an ambush, being prepared for what's to come, praying to idols, basically all the interesting situations that come up in any fantasy adventure. Now, a check is made same way you do an attack roll. You roll a d20. You try to get a number equal to or lower than the appropriate skill. Um, I don't count the exact number of skills, but there's like 12 to 15 of them, including things like body control, perception, craft, knowledge, stealth, and so on. Now, each character has a score in these, and it is worth noting that every character is unique. Each character has a, a one skill at a 14 and so on, and one skill at an eight. You're going to make your roll, then you're going to look up the results. In the adventure, uh, they did a nice job color coding these so they really stick out to see what happens. And there are four degrees of success here. You either critically fail, you fail, you succeed, or critically succeed. Now, the results are going to be based on the story, and they're very much dependent on the adventure. Most of them usually end up impacting the combat that's going to happen later. And trust me, combat's inevitable. So you might get some fate tokens. You might draw cards at the beginning. You might gain or lose some health. You might grab these tracking counters to track who knows what, which you don't know until you get there. You may get the play cards from that adventure deck and so on. So, and again, note, lower is better. This is a yeah. big adjustment for people rolling D20s. Uh, and most <laughs> of your, your tabletop RPG players uh, who are in North America not used to rolling low. Yes, totally agree. It is a change to get used to. So after you've done your check, the story continues. Uh, depending on the adventure, there might be one or more checks. There could be three more checks. There could be six. Your story is going to go on, but eventually it is going to lead to a combat. Now, I don't know if this is true of every adventure for Adventuria, but it is true of for every adventure in this box. Everything ends with a combat. 
Now, at the start of every combat, you're going to place a number of cards out on the table. These are those, those adventure cards. And the game comes with a serviceable play map for doing this and keeping things organized. Though I do say serviceable because they made it as generic as possible with plenty of room for all kinds of cards. But like we found... It worked better for some adventures than others. Sometimes we had to put cards duplicated in spots and it, it could be better, but then it would be overcrowded for other adventures. And it's not exactly a mat, more of mm. a fold out map almost. Hardcore players would almost certainly upgrade this to a neoprene mat pretty quickly, I would suspect. Now, those cards that you're putting out are include these adventure cards, which include things like hero actions. So a hero action card is a card that's in play that gives you a new option when you're when you're in combat. You're going to put out leaders that you need to face. There's always a time tracker, which you get to set at one of four difficulty levels. You also might need additional card decks. Like in the base game, there is an event deck, a leader action deck, and one we still haven't gotten to see, the demon action deck, that are all used for various adventures. Next, you're going to create the henchman deck. This is unique to this game and I thought was really neat. What you're going to do is look through all the henchmen you own. Like at this point, you only have the base box set, but if you open the 20 boxes, you're going to grab all your henchmen and look for a keyword that's set by the adventure. So these include things like orc, goblin, but also include like pirate or servant or undead. You're then going to make a deck out of that and seed the board with a number of henchmen based on the threat level. And now, just to note, this is something that sort of tripped me up as I was reading about it and hearing about it. These are the opponent's henchmen. Yes. These aren't, you're, you're not building a henchman, you're building the henchmen from the cards you own for your a opponent, the, the game to play yes. against you. Yeah, sorry, this isn't the Dungeons and Dragons. I heard a bunch of people go into the dungeon with me or, uh, uh, you know, torchbearers. These, these are orc guards and uh, what was the one we kept? The, the, there was a buccaneer. There was the one orc that was just terrible where it buffed the ones next to it and so on. Yeah, there was, yeah the shaman. Yeah. So once you have all this set up, you start combat. Now, combat is very similar to dueling, and this is why the game recommends you duel first. So at the start, it's the same. You're going to draw two cards and pick two cards to put down for, up to two cards to put down for endurance. You're going to play action cards. You're going to pay for them with endurance. You're going to take actions on those cards, including attacking. Now, note, some cards do work differently in adventure or duel mode, and that's just indicating the card, and it's pretty clear. Now, making attack works the same, except you're, of course, attacking leaders and henchmen, not the other players. Now, henchmen don't have a dodge value. But most of the leaders do. And one of the things we forgot the most often is rolling the leader's dodge. Well, that was our, you know, the first couple of games we played extreme. Remembering the leader has a dodge is something you need to get into your head because every leader we saw had one. Um, what henchmen do have and enemies do have is a set armor rating that just reduces the damage done. So they don't equip cards or anything like that. Now, when an opponent's defeated, it's just put in a discard pile and you do earn a fate point for dealing the final blow. And uh, so for mechanically, for getting fate points, uh, if you miss a roll, you get one. If you kill someone, you get one. Is that it? Is that the only, the, the only so two? So technically, it's, it's if you miss an attack or attack. a skill check. If you just fail on a attribute check, which does happen, you can't re-roll those. And you don't, you can't re-roll them, nor can you get fate. The important thing to note there is that is for um, dodge. Dodge is an attribute check. And I think that's the only reason the rule is there right. is so that you don't get a fate every time you miss dodging. <laughs> like, but that is the clarification. And in, a, in, in an adventure, the other ways you can get fate is there are cards that give you fate. Okay. And there can be, uh, we have seen it, so the hero actions for that particular adventure can earn you a fate. Okay. But the basic rules are miss an attack roll, miss a skill check, or defeat an opponent. And then modified by cards and everything else, just like every one of these card games. Now, along with the actions on your cards, there is those things I mentioned earlier, hero actions. These, this is a card that's on the table that's going to allow you to make a skill check during combat to do something cool. Uh, these are always thematically fun things. We've seen things like swinging from chandeliers, hiding in a crowd, uh, singing with a kobold, trying to solve puzzles, and so on. Now, fate points do work slightly different in a cooperative game. Fate can still be spent to re-roll a failed attack, but they can also be used to re-roll a failed skill roll. Again, a skill roll, not an attribute check. Also, you can use your fate points for other players. But when using them for other players, you can only use them to re-roll. So you can't use them for the things like draw an additional card or get endurance. You only do that for yourself, not your allies. So uh, what about the bad guys? When do they get to do stuff back at you? So 
after all the heroes have gone and everyone's done, they passed or whatever, the opponents now act. So each opponent takes action, starting with the leader and then moving on to the henchmen. And it's important you go left to right because the order of the henchmen come out and the, where they are can matter. Uh, you got to see that in the game we played where we had a card that buffed the cards next to it. Now, most opponents get a single action, but some will get more than one. And the ones that get more than one, it's often based on the number of people playing. So if you're playing a two-player adventure, your first boss fight, the leader might get two attacks or might get four, double the number of players. Interestingly, and I, this is one of my favorite parts of this game, actually, is to see what the bad guys do. You roll a d20 and then read the card. There's going to be a range of different effects some of which are attacks, but not all of them. With an opponent attack, there's no additional die roll to attack. They just do it. They do their thing. No, you do get to dodge. But the leaders and henchmen often have interesting and diverse things, like drawing more cards, like drawing something from the leader card deck, or drawing an event, or new henchmen coming into play, or your henchmen may run away, or they may heal everyone on the table. And I really dig this aspect of the game. Yeah, and it's fantastic that it's random what they do. You don't have to worry about if you hit them, they're always going to swing back or whatever. Uh, and the fact that there are blank actions, there are, you know, yeah. the, the the pirate sung, she, sung she, sea shanties at us at one point. Yes, yes. Uh, just they didn't do anything. They were just singing sea shanties. Yeah, I've, I've been insulted. I've gotten the evil eye and many other ways to basically say they miss or they don't attack. I thought it was really cool. Now, once all the opponents have acted, you go to that time tracker card I mentioned before and remove a time counter and see if anything interesting happens. Because what will happen is the time card itself will list a number of timed effects. And it'll just say like a number. It'll say five, this happens, and three, this happens, and one, this happens. What you do have to watch for, this doesn't happen to your first scenario, but later scenarios, is other places these times can show up. So leader cards might have them and some of the henchmen might have them on them as well so it's just a be aware of when the time counts down look at all the cards in play to make sure nothing interesting is happening so far i have not seen anything in any hero decks that are impacted by the time now, as expected, these do all kinds of things, just like everything else in this game. They cause some effect to the heroes. They change the hero's actions. Who knows? All kinds of things. Uh, the most common is obviously more henchmen join the fight. We saw that one quite often. Now, at the end of the round, start player token is past the left and a new round begins. Combat continues until either victory or defeat happens. And that sounds vague because it is because it's different depending on every scenario. These are very adventure specific and often don't involve just killing all the opponents on the table. It's nice that even if you do have to have combat, which I admit gives makes sense given the fact that this is a dueling card game, you don't always just have to kill everything. In yeah. fact, in, in some cases, you're really hoping for that certain die roll so people just run away. Yes. On a defeat, it's game over. Game over, man. You discard any reward cards you earned, you get no XP, and the game ends. You're welcome to try the same adventure again. You're welcome to pick a new hero or do whatever else you want to do. Now, when you win a combat, you will get a reward that will be listed in the adventure. This usually involves drawing random reward cards distributed among the group. Every adventure I played with rewards says one reward per each player, but I'm sure there are others. Doing this, you actually draw randomly from a deck, which is kind of cool. If you are playing in a multi-act adventure, you get to actually just toss that card in your deck. So that does break that deck building, but it's because it's the stuff you picked up during that adventure. It's only at the end of the adventure where you have to decide if you're going to modify your deck. Another common thing is experience points. This is a really simple XP system compared to um, D&D style XP. Now, if the combat you just completed is part of a multi-pack part adventure, you go through a process they call brief respite between acts. What's going to happen is you're going to get to bump your health back up to 30 if you're below it. And then you get this whole system with respite points, which I'm not going to get into details here. I get into way more detail on the blog, but you get to spend these points for getting additional healing, um, getting a practice card in play, training between battles, praying at the church, or just being more prepared. Now, one thing I didn't run into today, are you able to get more than 40 hit points? No, 40 hit points is your max at all times. As far as I know, the bad guys, though, I know at least one card that gave them three hit, three hit points each above their max. So again, to my knowledge, no, but this is a card game with exceptions. So there may be, I have not tried all four heroes now. I have seen three of the four heroes in place. So there might be the, the last hero may somehow find a way to do that. All right. So now you've completed your adventure. You've completed your combat and it ends up it's the end. 
like you're completed the adventure so that you either completed a single act short adventure like we played earlier today or the last act of a longer adventure now you're going to spend any of your earned experience points each point allows you to either write down one of the reward cards you earned during the adventure on your character sheet to keep it permanently or increase one of your skills by one each skill can be increased this way up to four times now, after finishing adventures successfully or not, you can now pick another adventure to play, but now there's a limitation. Now that you've beaten it at this level and gotten a reward, you can no longer play that same adventure at that same level or lower. You Next time you play it, you are forced to play it at a higher level or just play with a default character without any bonuses or grab another hero and play it again. I will say having played the same scenario multiple times now, it's fun. Like there, there there's no real disadvantage to playing it again. Uh, there's either some spoilers, but like there's not, there's no decisions there. Spoiled. There's no like you solved the mystery that's going to ruin it. Now, while this does give you a feel of ongoing adventure, like it, you do get some character advancement here and some form of campaign play, there's no actual limit or rules to what adventures you can take part in or what order you do them in. There's also no restriction on what characters can take part, except for that difficulty limit, that if you've beaten an adventure at a certain difficulty, you can't play it again at that difficulty. You don't need the same heroes or the same players or the same group or anything like that to play Adventuria. You can drop in and out wherever you want, and you can even swap characters between adventures, just not between acts. So it's very flexible, but at the cost of being not quite as legacy as we know you tend mm -hmm. to love, but still much better than, say, Cthulhu Death May Die. Totally agree. All right, so now that we've got an overview on how to play, what are your final thoughts on this Aventuria adventure card game? All right, so I got lots to say here. So this is going to be a nice quick summary. So back <laughs> in January, right, Ulysses Spiel reached out to me and offered to send me some no strings attached adventuria content. That's how it was worded. I had no idea what I was getting until this massive box showed up that I didn't even know what it was. I like this is a you know you ordered from Costco box. And as viewers of our live show got to see, when I opened this rather large package, I received from Ulysses, they sent pretty much every single English translated Aventuria product, including a number of boxes that still aren't actually released in North America and had only recently been translated. And to say I was overwhelmed is a huge understatement. Like this was like shocking, jaw-dropping. Like we were looking at more than 20 game boxes here and I didn't even know how to approach this. Like, what do I do with this? And for one, there's nothing like the Aventuria adventure card. It doesn't say core set or core box or start here or anywhere on it. So I ended up actually writing my contact and go, what do I do? And he's like, all right, find the box that says Aventuria adventure card game at uh, the box we're talking about tonight. Start there. <laughs> It was amusing, uh, almost clown car esque yes. in unpacking the uh, unpackaging the episode uh, at the end of the episode. Boxes just kept coming out of this this packing crate. I think by the end it was about a five foot high stack, and I'm not exaggerating. So. What I decided to do is start with that, right? So I grabbed that box. The other thing I grabbed that was a recommendation is a small box expansion called the Taylor, the Master Taylor's Poltergeist, which is a demo kit. Uh, more details about that next week. This is a, a small box that can, contains simplified hero decks for all the four hero, all, for all the four heroes and a really short adventure that's great for learning the game. It's literally one check than a combat. This is a fantastic place to start if you can do it, but I'll give you more details on that next week. Now, once I sat down and read the rules, actually Sean read them ahead of time and said, this doesn't sound so bad. Um, I was still kind of scared, especially because we only looked at the one book at that point. This is by far the easiest of any adventure card game I've ever played. It is the easiest to learn and the quickest to get to the table. Like during our first session, Deanna and I sat down, fought out a single duel and played the short adventure again, both from master Taylor's poltergeist. And, and that was 40 minutes total, maybe including like rule references and looking stuff up. This was more than enough to teach us the basis of the system and got us ready for playing the full game. Again, if you can get a copy of that demo kit, which I haven't figured out quite how to do that yet, it is worth doing. 
Uh, I have seen copies of it, uh, at least uh, on stores, whether or not they're available and uh, or uh, in, but they, they, there are stores out there that, that do stock right. the Poltergeist. Good, because so. it was a backer reward during their latest Kickstarter. It didn't say it was a Kickstarter exclusive, but it was a backer reward on their latest Kickstarter. Right. So this is quite a bit different than, for instance, the Lord of the Rings adventure game, where there were any number of tutorials to slowly work you up to being able to play the massively complex, integrated aspects of the full game. Yeah. Like, I can't help but compare this to the Pathfinder Adventure card game for a very similar feel with the stories and the checks and everything like that. And I've mentioned many times just how thick and dense that rule book is and how it reads more like a, uh, uh, what do you call it? I can't think of the word, a technical manual than it does a game set of rules. Whereas this felt like, here's a game, sit down and play, do this, try this and do it. Bang, done. So I gotta say that I, I, this was so much more approachable. So then we went on to play the game using full decks, the, the ones in the box set, and the game got even better. Like, it was good. Even that demo was like, if I played this demo at Origins, because that's what it's designed for, right? Or I played it at a local con, I'd be sold. I'd be like, all right, I want to know more. And this was even better. Uh, we both ended up actually enjoying the dual system and found it, honestly, to be up there with many other dueling card games. I'm not going to name specifics, but it's up there. Like, uh, Sean got to try it today. It is a solid two-player game. Well, it could be up to more. We only tried two player. You can play three and four player, but it is a solid dueling card game. The highlight of this, though, that I think sets it apart from other dueling card games, and you may love it or hate it for this, is the management of endurance. That is such a, a painful, in a good way, experience. Uh, the trying to decide what cards to convert to endurance when to do when to convert to endurance and how much and when do you have enough that you don't want to burn any more cards and oh so many times where i'm like no i don't need endurance only to draw a new hand of cards be like oh i totally should put that as endurance i love the decision making process just that the start of every round just fills you with this oh what do i do yeah, and unlike Magic, where you're used to those dedicated cards giving you mana, you're giving up useful things, right? You have mm -hmm. a 30-card deck, and in, ideally, you've built that deck out of things you want in your deck. Yep. So you have to give up things you want. And while you might get lucky and find a card that lets you swap something out, that's They're... rare, uh, I had one in the, in the deck I was playing, uh, but I never even got to use it really. Um, so one of the things that's really important I find in this game and, and I, I, I suffered from not having today is deck knowledge, right? Yeah. Knowing the composition of your deck so mm -hmm. that you are best able to make those decisions as to whether or not you might or might not want something, or if it's too early and you're never going to get that down to the table. So just burn it as endurance right yeah. off. And that is also where fight a few duels before you try an adventure to get to know your deck. Like, I know Sean. Sean's played enough games with me. We could have dove right into Adventure, but I wanted to start with a duel just for each him to get to see most of the cards in his deck. Now, the other thing that I thought felt very different than many of the other card games is that most of the cards in your deck are permanents. So you pay for them, and then they go and play, and they stay there. And most of them cost maybe one Endurance to use every round. And like they might cost as much as nine to put down. Yes, I had, there is a deck, a card in the dwarf deck, the dwarf smith deck. It's not the right word, blacksmith. The dwarf blacksmith that has a nine cost card. But once it's down, it only costs one to play. And while there are some cards that make you discard or redraw cards that are in play, uh, Sean got to experience that one during our duel. Uh, for the most part, you play a card and it's there forever, which just felt different from most other card games. Now, my one problem with this system is that it doesn't really make a lot of sense as an ongoing story or thematically. At the beginning of every combat, you start fresh. The beginning of every adventure, you got your hero card, your basic attack on it, and that's it. Now, during the fight, you're going to ready some weapons, don some armor, reveal that you have skills and talents, and in general, build this fighting engine out of your cards. And while I understand it's a game, and to make it fun, you need to reset that, it just seems silly that my dwarf forgets his warfare skill every fight, and I can't locate my weapons at the start of every battle. So, as far as I can tell, adventures only happen when you're camped for the night. You've yeah. stripped off your armor, polished your weapons, slipped into your sleeping bag, and then they attack. 
which would be great if that's how it was written thematically. That would be pretty boring, but it's definitely not. The ongoing story, your characters should be ready for these fights that are about to happen. And then added to that, there's this weird aspect where at the start of every adventure, they tell you when it happened in the background. And this is something I didn't mention at all in my written review, but there is quite a bit of background in here on the Dark Eye and the continent and the gods and all that stuff. And they have a, a date system. And well, every adventure tells you what date it takes part. Well, the four, three adventures in the base box are hundred hundreds of years apart and like how are the same characters taking part in these different adventures like i don't know i i have to assume at least thematically it's a fantasy game but like they found a time machine now well not thematic really it that it, yes it's always you woke up in the morning you're completely unprepared and you forget all your skills well it might work maybe you get blackout drunk every time i don't know but this system works really well mechanically it's something sean hinted at earlier the slow escalation of only getting a little bit of endurance and having to play weak cards and maybe getting out maybe one weapon or getting a couple cards that'll give you re-rolls or something shifting over to suddenly having all kinds of endurance be able to play what you want having more actions available because the beginning of the game it's like okay i can do my basic attack and that's it and then eventually ramping up to playing these big cards and having a fully equipped and trained character just feels good it feels really rewarding it has a really great progression so if you were to start off fully kitted out you'd need a much different set of opponent or opponents yeah. to deal with the difficulty and balancing that difficulty would be quite difficult from a gameplay game design standpoint yeah i agree like the game just wouldn't work honestly like if you just started with everything in play like why do you have cards go ahead <laughs> just make a D, D character or a dark eye character and fight another dark eye character at that point i think now the other thing is i found this system works really well emotionally right every game of adventure including the one we played this morning starts off with this feeling of kind of hopelessness and being overwhelmed. You end up taking a lot of damage in the early rounds due to not having any armor up. And there are so many henchmen in play and they're all getting all these actions when you only got to do one little thing. And there's all these tests you have to make before you can even win the fight with the, with the hero abilities. And then there's, as you're going, you, you start to feel better. You're like, okay, all right, I've, I've got some endurance now. And, oh, I, I actually can do two different attacks around. So we might get through these. And things don't seem so hopeless anymore. Though even late in the combat, when you've got some of your best cards in play, victory is not assured in an Aventuria. While we've completed every included adventure here on the easy difficulty, and a couple of them, I always look at the normal difficulty, go, would we have won if we were on normal? None of these combats felt easy. And then, like, I've only compared normal and easy. There are two more difficulty levels. And based on threads on Board Game Geek, Nightmare is appropriately named. <laughs> and this is just the base box set. Yeah. Three adventures, four characters with multiple difficulties to work through. So given the really reasonable price, this is a very solid amount of content you're getting. And, and as I mentioned earlier, I find each adventure rather replayable more than i would would expect um like sean played one tonight i'm sure he'd be perfectly willing to try it again with a different character yeah. or with the same character on a higher difficulty level now while duels are interesting and fun uh to be honest more than i thought they would be the real joy though is playing the cooperative adventure mode and the stories involved the writing here is excellent ignoring some minor translation issues and the stories are evocative and fun like each has been very distinct providing interesting narrative experiences and surprisingly varied combats for what's basically the same system every time yeah it's i'll be the first to admit that while translation errors are frustrating german is a language that is not easy to translate to english uh, with their ability to compound nouns for building words and concepts with much more flexibility than English mm. has. Now, what you won't find here at all is any role-playing experience, unless you bring it to the table and do some talking as your character or whatever, trash talking. There are no actual decisions to be made during the narrative phase. 
while you are rolling some checks, you don't get to pick what checks to make. At least in the adventures in this box, you're never presented with like a which way do you take the path or do you go to the castle? None of that's here. Again, just in the base box. Now, while the stories feel very much like a fantasy adventure from the Dark Eye, they've got that Germanic feel. To me, they feel like Warhammer adventures. You're not actually getting the player agency you would get from a role-playing game. And mentioning those translation issues, there are a number of them, but thankfully in every case, we were able to figure out what was supposed to be said. Now, in most cases, it's just missing articles, right? Uh, the, a, and he, but there is one minor layout issue where just something's in the wrong part of a page. The big problem though is act three of the three-part adventure. They obviously copy pasted the combat section from the last act and forgot to replace some of it. There is a list of cards that you put into play that actually all come from act two. Now, again, it was pretty easy to figure out what should have been there based on other sections of the text and what your physical cards have when you're in act three, but it is a pretty big mistake. Yeah, German has a rich set of articles, but it doesn't always use them, uh, which may come into play here. Although, really, there's no excuse. You need to have someone read through and check your work. Yeah, and I'm sure they had someone, but they, they definitely missed them. Now, another aspect I do appreciate, which we mentioned earlier, is the fact there is some form of character advancement, even if it isn't much. Well, yes, I would have liked a more of a continuing story campaign system. I also love the fact I don't need to get the same people together to be able to keep playing the game. Now, it'll be interesting to see if future expansions add more ongoing story or if they stick to this three-act adventure at the longest and then you move on. So... Who is this game really going to go into the buy column for? Who And who is maybe going to give it a pass? All right. So overall, I, I enjoy checking this out. Like I went from honestly being completely intimidated by this massive amount of stuff I got from Ulysses Spiels to the opposite. Right now, I'm like, all right, when we're done the podcast, can we open another box? Like, like <laughs> let's look at what's in this one. I want to see what henchmen come with this one. Well, what's this character do? If you enjoy these adventure card games, right, the, these recreations of RPG-like experiences, these thematic story games, and this is definitely on the thematic side, there's a lot to like here in Adventuria. Uh, we found the onboarding to be excellent. And to be honest, the learning curve is very shallow. We often complain about steep learning curves, especially in other collectible card, collectible and non-collectible card games. You didn't have that here. This was pretty simple, especially if you played a F20, a D&D style combat ever in your life. The basic mechanics are here. You're rolling to hit and you're rolling damage and they get to roll the dodge. I love the fact that you have two modes to play. The dual mode is up there with other dueling card games. And the cooperative adventure modes is one of the most fun I played. Like this adventure mode is really what I like the most. This this is the highlight to me. I to be honest, I don't play magic anymore. I dug sorcerer, but I don't play it a lot. The the cooperative game is is the joy we had here. I love the interesting and engaging stories that felt very different despite all being the same mechanics. Like they did a great job of making every combat unique. If you dig games that like you let you take part in a great story, check Adventuria out. Now, what you're not getting, though, is a role-playing game. Uh, you're a witness here to the great story. This is, this is a card game that tells RPG-like stories, but does lack any player agency in regard to that story. You can't do what you want. You can't drive the different path. You can't avoid the adventure. You can't go do side quests. If you're looking for a role-playing game, you're probably going to want to check out the Dark Eye Core Rules, which is what this game is based on, or some other role-playing game. But if you're a fan of those kind of games and you don't have the time or the, the, the regular schedule or be able to commit to a game or you don't have anyone who wants to play that GM role, Adventuria might scratch that RPG story taking part in a fantasy story itch. Personally, I'm loving everything I've seen in this game so far, minus a couple of translation issues. And I am really excited to play through the adventures we've already beaten at a higher difficulty level. I replayed one today at the same difficulty level with a different character. And I am looking forward, honestly, looking forward to diving into all of the expansion content, which you'll be able to tune in here to hear about as I get through my pile of Adventuria stuff. Well, that's it for our review of the Aventuria Adventure card game. For an even more detailed look at this non-collectible card game, check out the written review over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. 
And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, so ever since more Adventuria, sorry people who are sick about hearing about Adventuria, but that's what we've been playing. So ever since trying this out, like ever since we sat there, Deanna and I, we broke out the Master Taylor's Poltergeist set. We've been hooked. Uh, we've now tried out a full duel. We played through all of the adventures in the base box. Uh, now I've tried one of them twice. Um, I even took some time to unbox the other adventure area content. I went and looked what's next. What's the what's the next step? Um, so that way we can dig into some of the adventure expansion material. Uh, some of that I was able to get to the table right away. So our last game, I actually, well, sorry, not my last game now. Our last game with Deanna and I um, actually featured the new dice from the arsenal and the dragon and hell wheels from the wheel of life expansion yeah and i i haven't played uh physical yet but we did finally get it to the table on virtual tabletop mm -hmm. uh and so uh i've been i've even been playing <laughs> aventuria yeah. yeah so there there is a tabletop simulator mod or whatever you call them uh work what is it work ben, what is it the work something mod i something. can't remember the word where you, you make a table, you collect it on the W word, and you can start a game. It is free, so if anyone does want to check it out, note though it is, uh, while it's scripted, it is not scripted to do what you'd want it to do. We'll just put it that way. Most of it's an empty table, but it'll put the cards out and set it up for, for a couple short adventures. It includes the three-act adventure and the first adventure from the book, not the middle one. If you have someone who knows how to play, it is a great way to play the game. So getting back to the new stuff we tried out. So... Starting with Arsenal of Heroes, uh, when my unboxing video goes live, I don't know when we'll get that up, but I was kind of shocked by this because it's meant as a dual expansion for the dual mode of the game, though it does have use if you're playing adventures, but it's meant for a single player, not for a group, which really surprised me. So what it gives is a full set of D20s that are color-coded to match the attack types and the dodge stat which is kind of interesting. And then in a bunch of D6s based on various weapons and they're color-coded and they have the weapons on them. Then you get what I think is the big draw of this is a pack of duplicate cards from the core set, but just the non-unique cards and two copies of each. Uh, as a bonus, you also get two copies of the five promo cards that had originally come out for the game. So these aren't available anywhere else unless you went to the White Right Con or whatever. Maybe they're in the first Kickstarter. I don't know where they came from. So what this does is it lets a single player have some shiny new dice, and be able to build every possible deck combination from the core game with every possible combination. Now, what it doesn't do is let four different players collect every possible deck combination. So while having the set for a group will open up the options, it's just not what I expected. Though I've got to say, this is a better alternative than buying a second core box. There is no reason with this out, in my opinion, to buy a second core box. Now, what you might want to do is have like your GM who usually buys the games by the game and then each player buys an arsenal set if they want it. But if you are also, if you're interested in tournament play, I think this is a must buy because it gives you those extra cards and it gives you, like I said, every possible deck combination with the cards from those four heroes. Yeah, I have to say, having played the game myself now, uh, as part of the, uh, the, the dice themselves are kind of silly. Um, yeah. they're, they're neat, but uh, pointless is, is yeah. word. there's nothing, there's no reason one D 20 and one D six can't service all your needs. No, I, uh, I will admit you need three D six. I have seen cards do three D six. I don't want to roll the same die three times. I want to roll all my damage at once. That, that is the one thing, but the game comes with four right. Just share them. Yep. <laughs> so now as for wheel of life, um, this is just a bunch of health trackers. And the weird part is it looks like the game originally came with these, then swapped to the cards and then went back, which I thought was kind of strange. Um, having now used both, I prefer these. These are way better. There's no chance of bumping them. Cards just get moved. Like you breathe heavy and a card slides. They're not great for keeping things in set spots. So... I, I thought it, it was it was a good addition. Um, there's a weird thing with gender swapping, which is well done, but I don't you don't have that for the hero cards. So somewhere out there is an expansion that gives you replacement hero cards that these discs would work with. If I have that, I have no idea where it is in the pile of stuff. But just as to replace using the health trackers are better. You put it on the table, you turn it. Plus, even the mass easier. I can count one, two, three, four, five instead of having to use my card to slide it another way. What I did like. There's a bonus I had no clue was in there until the unboxing is this thing that's called the dragon. 
Now, what it is, is it's a little token that's the same size as the fate tokens. And what you do is you swap it from one of the fate tokens in the game. And whenever you earn fate, you can take the dragon token instead. Now, what that lets you do is you can turn it in later after an opponent's roll to make them re-roll. And this applies both in a duel or an adventure. So in a duel, it would be your opponent's attack rolls or whatever. Whereas in an adventure, it'd be that D20 roll to see what the thing does. And I thought that was neat. Like it's a simple addition to the game, but gives you some new options, right? Instead of re-rolling your own stuff, you force your opponents to re-roll. Yeah, no, it's very, very fun and uh, just a neat twist on what's already a great mechanic with the fate tokens. All right, well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Well, what I want to do is play more Aventuria. Um, we have two new characters available uh, th that are available, plus there's uh, ones in the main box we haven't done. So Deanna and I have talked about just swapping up to the other two characters in the base set. Um, diving into the first official expansion, which I understand is still the next step, which is Forest of No Return Adventure Box, which actually does come with a character in there as well. So that'll bring us up to five total characters, which interestingly enough, if we were allowed to gather, we can now play five players. Um, also, we still haven't finished up our Magical Kitties adventure. The, the library is sitting in, um, in stasis right now with things unresolved uh unfortunately we weren't able to play to do this past week due to um we'll just say one of my kids was not being a team player during the week now what i should do is we really should get aroma to the table uh it's the game that's been on the pile of obligation the longest and I, we really should just at least get that down and sit and play it and uh good games publishing we kind of put their stuff aside like we've loved everything we tried we we're all into it just kind of got distracted with the new shiny uh we need to get some unfair played i need to play unfair with some new decks and get that done all right right now it's still thumbs up looks like a great game i doubt that's going to change but we haven't done a formal review yet and Guildmaster has been sitting there as well now Guildmaster, there's a bit of a reason it looks like it needs three players to be good you can play three but it's a take that game and two player would take that eh, sort of eh, so so and there's even an auction mechanic so i really want to play it with three but i'm thinking i might break this one out for the kids which wasn't my originally plan just to get it done now, maybe we'll be really lucky, though. The I don't know what will happen. The, the the stars will align and we'll fit in all of the above. So my 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 optimistic self is I'm, we're going to play more Adventuria. We're going to finish Magic Kitties. We're going to play Aroma and try out Guildmaster and then try out some new combos and Unfair. The odds of that happening, we'll see. <laughs> all righty. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. David Miller Jr. Thanks, David. Ryan Kurtz, thanks for joining us tonight and all your interaction on the Discord and for the heads up on the incorrect link on our webpage. Yuho Rutila, thank you. Jeff Seuss, thanks, Jeff. And Kevin Reno, who's just waiting for you to draw his name again at midnight. <laughs> Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means our shift's coming to an end. We're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like the content we're providing, it would be awesome if you headed over to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and tip your bellhops. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game, game on. on.